If you've been keeping up with the crypto headlines, you'll know that Ethereum insiders, including the Ethereum Foundation and Vitalik Buterin himself, have been selling large amounts of ETH. Many are naturally wondering whether this is contributing to ETH's underperformance. So today, we'll take a look at these sales as well as other key factors that could be holding Ethereum back. If you hold ETH in your portfolio or are thinking about picking some up, this is a video you have to watch right till the end. Now let's start with the Ethereum Foundation. For those unfamiliar, the Ethereum Foundation is a non-profit organization based in Switzerland. It was created by Vitalik Buterin and other Ethereum founders in 2014 and is run by an executive board consisting of three people. Vitalik, Executive Director Aya Miyaguchi, and board member Patrick Storchenegger. Essentially, it operates as a sort of team of teams, with each team focusing on different elements of Ethereum's development. On the Foundation's website, it describes itself as, quote, not a tech company or a normal non-profit. Anyway, the Foundation's purpose is to support Ethereum's future without controlling it in any way, in order for the project to remain decentralized. This support comes from allocating resources to critical projects that provide value to Ethereum's ecosystem and by funding research, development, and education. The funds come out of its massive treasury. Prominent Foundation researcher Justin Draker said it spends roughly $100 million per year and currently has a 10-year runway, depending on ETH's price. And according to Arkham Intelligence, the foundation is sitting on a treasury of around $670 million at the time of shooting, with funds mostly held in ETH, obviously. Now, despite decentralization efforts, the foundation is the most influential organization in Ethereum's ecosystem. As such, when it starts offloading its ETH, you can bet your bottom guay that investors will be paying attention, especially given the foundation's history of timing the market incredibly well. For instance, in May 2021, the Ethereum Foundation sold around 35,000 ETH at an average price of around $3,500. ETH's price then fell in the few months that followed, at one point dipping by more than 50%. And if you thought that was crazy, consider that the Foundation also sold 20,000 ETH on the 17th of November 2021, just one day after ETH hit its all-time high, a level that it has yet to reclaim. More recently, the foundation has been selling off much smaller amounts of ETH, but this hasn't stopped investors worrying that these sales mark local tops. For context, in January this year, it sold more than 600 ETH, worth around $1.6 million. Throughout July, the foundation sold another 350 ETH for around $1.1 million. Notably, that same month also saw the foundation move a whopping 92,000 ETH worth around $290 million from a wallet that had been dormant for seven years, although it's not clear if any or all of this has been sold. And in September, the Ethereum Foundation sold another 450 ETH for $1 million. So, in total, the Ethereum Foundation has sold around 240,000 ETH since January 2021. In fact, at the time of shooting this, it sold a total of 3,064 ETH, worth roughly $9 million since the start of 2024 alone. Given how recent the last sale was, it could be even more by the time you watch this video. We'll leave a link in the description for a site that tracks these transactions on chain, by the way. The point is, if we plot these sales onto ETH's chart, it quickly becomes apparent that soon after each sale, ETH's price takes a dip. And by the way, if you're enjoying the video so far, fire up those like and subscribe buttons and turn on those notifications to make sure you catch our next one. Hello, hello, it's me, Guy's Cousin Barry. I'm very, very sorry to be interrupting this, no doubt, fascinating video, but I want to tell you about the Coin Bureau deals page. So listen up and listen well. All right, this is the place where you will find all the amazing promos and discounts what you, as Coin Bureau viewers, are entitled to. So don't be a mug, 
Go and check it out using the link below. You'll find discounts on hardware wallets. You'll find exchange sign-up bonuses, some of which are absolutely bleeding mental. And you will find trading fee discounts there as well, as well as a whole load of other goodies too. And let me tell you, old Barrington here, he's had to hammer the dog and bone all bleeding day and night to get you these promos and discounts. So you're welcome. Thank you very much. Go and have a look pronto. Or I'll have to come and have a word. All right. Now, the thing is, it's not just the Ethereum Foundation that's coming under fire for selling. Vitalik himself has also been in the spotlight for his recent sales of ETH. What? <laughs> Naturally, this has raised some eyebrows considering just how important Vitalik is to Ethereum as a whole. On the 9th of August, the VDOG transferred 3,000 ETH, worth around $8 million, to a multisig wallet. On the 30th of August, he transferred another 800 ETH to the same multisig, which then started selling in stages. The multisig made five transactions of 190 ETH, each worth over $470,000, spaced out every three days. The end result was that in the first few weeks of September, Vitalik had sold a total of 950 ETH for around $2.2 million. Surprise, surprise, this selling got people on X talking, with some voicing concerns that Vitalik was bullposting while making sales. Others said that this was a sign that Vitalik and other Ethereum developers were dumping on the market. To be fair, it isn't hard to see why these conclusions would be drawn. However, it's important to note that Vitalik has stated that these sales were not for profit. Rather, they were actually made on behalf of a biodefense group that he funds. He's also said that the fifth transaction of 190 ETH would be the last one, which I suppose we'll just have to take his word for. Vitalik also responded to someone on X who was defending his right to take profits by saying he hadn't actually sold any ETH to keep the proceeds since 2018. He later added that while the proceeds are used to support various projects, he doesn't plan to invest into L2s and other token projects for the foreseeable future. When asked why, he explained that by donating funds rather than investing into the cryptos themselves, he can instead ask for a commitment to better the Ethereum ecosystem in return or to better humanity in some way. Plus, it allows him to distance himself to avoid any scrutiny. In Vitalik's words, he'd rather have, quote, a clear stance that sets an example and increases confidence that I'm not part of some plot to twist the Ethereum protocol in directions that benefit random infrared slash L2 tokens that I hold. Wise words. Now, while these sales might be the talk of CryptoTown, the reality is that they're not the only reason why ETH has been underperforming lately. Another obvious reason would be the disappointing spot Ethereum ETF inflows, especially when you compare them to their spot Bitcoin counterparts. Unlike the spot Bitcoin ETFs, the spot Ethereum ETFs have had a rough start. To give you an idea of the difference, consider that since their debut in January, the spot Bitcoin ETFs have had a cumulative total net inflow of over $17 billion, making them the fastest adopted ETF products of all time. By contrast, the spot Ethereum ETFs have had a cumulative net outflow of almost $600 million since they launched in June, a much weaker reception to what was expected before they were suddenly approved by the SEC. Now, this is likely for a few reasons. For one, Ethereum suffers from a sales pitch issue. That's simply because Bitcoin is much easier to understand than Ethereum, which is incredibly technical, especially to non-crypto natives. Bitcoin's digital gold label is also a much more attractive investment thesis for more traditional investors, particularly those that aren't as risk-averse. For better or for worse, it seems most investors see BTC as a risk asset. This means that ETH, and any other altcoin for that matter, only adds additional layers to that risk, which may not be ideal under current macro conditions. Whatever the reason for the spot Ethereum ETF underperformance, though, it presents a major concern. That's because it was widely believed that institutional interest would be a key future demand driver for Ethereum. It's difficult to say that institutional interest in Ethereum is there when its spot ETFs have seen so much in outflows since they debuted just a few months back. That said, though, this doesn't mean that there isn't money flowing in. In fact, the spot Ethereum ETFs have seen over $2 billion of inflows. The reason why there are overall net outflows 
is because of Grayscale's Ethereum trust, which, as with its Bitcoin trust, has seen massive outflows to the tune of $2.7 billion since its conversion into an ETF. When you take this into consideration, it's perhaps a bit surprising that we've seen ETH bashing on X become something of a sport. In any case, although the spot Ethereum ETF underperformance has shaken confidence in Ethereum in the short term, it's likely to be a bullish tailwind in the long term. Sadly, however, the list of reasons why ETH has been underperforming doesn't stop there. There are other factors at play here too. While interest in the broader market has been a bit meh, to say the least, Ethereum has been facing problems of its own. At the macro level, some investors are even worrying about the prospect of an impending recession. When fears like that start to arise, investors typically flip to more risk-off assets, which means less attention being drawn to riskier assets like Ethereum. There are also concerns around the tech sector in general, with some investors believing we're in a tech stock bubble that's about to pop. These fears were made worse after Nvidia saw a record $279 billion shaved off its market cap in early September. This was concerning news for the tech sector as a whole. As you'll probably know, Nvidia has been the stock market darling of late. And there are also several crypto-specific reasons for ETH's underperformance. For one, the reduced activity on the layer one base chain has led to lower network fees and in turn, lower ETH demand. Sure, this is a bullish signal for layer two adoption, but it also poses a threat to the base chain in terms of long-term incentives. In fact, network fees on Ethereum have recently dropped to their lowest levels in over four years, with fee revenue having collapsed by 99% in the past six months as more users opt for layer two solutions instead. This is why Fred Krueger, a Bitcoin maxi, has said that ETH is in a death spiral because its fee revenue of just $73 million per year doesn't justify a $300 billion market cap. Just don't ask about Bitcoin's fee revenue relative to its market cap. And layer twos aren't just affecting fees either. They're also impacting Ethereum's user experience. While layer twos have their benefits, they also make using Ethereum much more confusing, especially when there are other layer ones out there that can handle pretty much anything you can throw at them without the need for additional protocols. And that's just considering the crypto natives. I mean, can you imagine how daunting it must be for people who are comparatively new to this technology to learn how multiple blockchains are stacked together to perform specific smart contract functionality? The reality is that as Ethereum's layer two space becomes more and more convoluted, this will likely push people to other networks that are much easier to use and to understand. Obviously, the standout example here that springs to mind is Solana, which you'll know is much faster and cheaper than Ethereum, giving the average user a much better experience, provided it's actually working, that is. But of course, it's not just other altcoins. ETH has been underperforming against BTC for quite some time now. Specifically, ETH has been struggling on its BTC pair since September 2022. And while Ethereum has been struggling to garner attention to take it to new all-time highs, Bitcoin has been busy outperforming the majority of the crypto market. At the time of shooting, Bitcoin's dominance is over 56%. And you can learn more about that by watching our recent video about ETH's underperformance using the link in the description. So then, what's next for Ethereum? Well, to answer this, we'll start by addressing the question in the introduction. ETH's underperformance is unlikely to be due to sales made by Ethereum insiders. Contrary to popular belief, not all Ethereum Foundation sales have been followed by major market corrections. For instance, back in December 2020, the Ethereum Foundation sold a whopping 100,000 ETH. Soon afterwards, the price of ETH actually rallied by more than 630%. Now, obviously, that's not to say the same will happen here, but it's food for thought nonetheless. The caveat is that all these ETH sales probably didn't take place immediately. It's also worth remembering that sales coming from the Ethereum Foundation, and Vitalik for that matter, come at a time when the Fed is about to cut interest rates. And although they've put a bit of a dampener on things, outflows from the spot Ethereum ETFs are slowing down. And with a bit of luck, the inflows could start to ramp up again. And luckily, there's a catalyst on the horizon that could help Ethereum gather bullish momentum. 
That's because Ethereum will soon be going through a major upgrade named Pectra, which follows the Denkun upgrade from earlier this year. If Pectra is as successful as Denkun was, this could be huge for Ethereum. So, to bring you up to speed, Pectra is expected to go live sometime between the end of 2024 and early 2025. In a nutshell, it will introduce several improvements, mainly focusing on optimizing Ethereum's user experience. Not only that, but Pectra will also introduce big upgrades to Ethereum wallets, which will soon be able to batch transactions for users to sign them off in a single step. In other words, this will allow wallets to act like smart contracts. Pectra will also allow staking providers to consolidate their staked ETH by increasing the staking limit from 32 ETH to 2048 ETH. This should reduce the number of messages passed around on the network, potentially improving the network's efficiency. Pectra will also make improvements to the developer experience on the Layer 1 and Layer 2 chains, and presumably this is extended to Layer 3s as well. And speaking of Layer 2s, Vitalik has also emphasized the need for increased decentralization on Layer 2 chains. In a recent post on X, he stated that, quote, Starting next year, I plan to only publicly mention, in blogs, talks, etc., L2s that are stage 1 plus. It doesn't matter if I invested or if you're my friend. Stage 1 or bust. Now, for context, the stage 1 Vitalik is talking about is a level of decentralization outlined by L2 Beat. And this standard has been adopted as a sort of decentralization roadmap by most Layer 2 scaling solutions. Now, Vitalik argues that Stage 1 is a very reasonable and moderate milestone and says that, quote, the era of rollups being glorified multisigs is coming to an end. The era of cryptographic trust is upon us. Whew, exciting times. So then, this leads us to the all important question what does all of this mean for Ethereum? Well, while ETH's chart sure does leave a lot to be desired, the future does seem to be brightening up for the second largest crypto out there. The Pectra upgrade will be a leap in the right direction in terms of Ethereum's user experience, and let's be honest, that definitely needs sprucing up. What's even better is that although we have some of the core details about what will be included in the upgrade, we don't yet have the full picture. Although it might sound incomplete, this is actually bullish because it means that more Ethereum Improvement Proposals, or EIPs, can be put forward. Really, the more the merrier, assuming there aren't any notable consequences, of course. But if Denkun is anything to go by, the next major upgrade could be great news for Ethereum's users and investors. It's also great to see Vitalik putting his foot down about Layer 2 decentralization. As you'll probably know, the vast majority of Layer 2s are extremely centralized because they run on a single sequencer node. In other words, they have a single point of failure. Not only has this been a concern for ETH holders, but resolving this will also help make Ethereum even more decentralized than it is already, which makes it more secure and, therefore, more valuable. To be fair, a lot of Layer 2s are actively working towards using a decentralized sequencer already, and you can learn more about what some of these have been getting up to by using the link in the description. In any case, it's worth keeping in mind just how monumental Ethereum is, and not just in terms of market cap. Its developers are at the top of their game and are more than talented enough to overcome the challenges that lie ahead. There's honestly no better team to push Ethereum to greatness. And that's one of the reasons why I and some members of the Coin Bureau team continue to hold ETH in our personal portfolios. And you can learn more about what else we hold in our portfolios by becoming a Coin Bureau Club member. You'll also find small cap altcoin reviews as voted on by you, get daily alpha from members of the team, and have access to our exclusive Discord channel alongside the best community in crypto. Simply follow the link in the description and we'll see you on the other side. Okay, that just about wraps it up for today, folks. So if you enjoyed today's video, help us out by hitting those like, subscribe, and notification buttons. If you know someone who'd love this sort of content, then help them find it by sharing it with them. Thank you so much for watching, and we will see you in the next one. This is Guy, signing off.